Hello again, everybody. This is Pastor Tony. Welcome to lesson number seven already in the third series in the Healing 101 course. And I know we are spending some extra time on some of this because I want to cover it thoroughly because this is really what trips people up in coming and receiving healing from God. They can see healing belongs to them, but then when it comes down to actually receiving by faith the healing that God has already provided, that sin consciousness, that the enemy will bring accusation and condemnation to them and get them really peeled off from them seeing themselves in Christ, who is their qualification. And, uh, and he will just disqualify them to the point that they'll just back off and they will not receive what rightfully, legally belongs to all of us in Christ Jesus. And I tell you, this kind of revelation that we're talking about right here, when you really receive that on the heart level, it's going to go off on you like fireworks. I'm telling you, it'll, it'll be firing off like dynamite in your spirit. And that faith will just come roaring out and you will take what rightfully belongs to you in Christ. Now, if you're still seeing yourself outside of Jesus, you're not going to see yourself the way God sees you. And of course, the enemy will play on that and he will, he will nail you and he will keep you from receiving what rightfully belongs to you in Christ. So I'm spending a little extra time making sure we go through this thoroughly so that you get a full revelation of this. And you have to keep in mind, again, as we've already established the last couple of lessons, that when you see Jesus dealing with the sin issue, when you see him going to the cross to pay the price for our sin and our justification, our forgiveness of sins, then at the same time, he's also taking care of of healing and wholeness, of you being able to legally receive healing and wholeness in your physical body. And we're seeing this over and over again in the Word of God. Now, let's look over to the book of Hebrews again today. There's so much that we could cover in the book of Hebrews, but I'm, I'm just kind of hitting highlights here because I really want to point out the fact that Jesus and His finished work has already taken care of the sin issue. There's not a sin problem anymore. There's a problem with sin consciousness in the hearts and the minds of the believers. But as we get our minds renewed to this right here, as we receive this revelation and get our minds renewed to it, and, and sometimes you just have to wholesale throw out a lot of religious traditional ideas that have told us some contrary to this. I know I had to, I can tell you, I had to plow up that stuff and replant the revelation of God's word in me so that, you know, then faith is really, faith is just a response at that point. You don't have to go try to muster it up. You don't try to have to go beg God for days and weeks and try to wear him out. God has already established. This is established in the finished work of Jesus. All these things that we're talking about right here. Now, the last lesson, if you missed the previous lessons, I encourage you, stop this, go back and listen to those because we've already laid a lot of foundation working up to this one. But in the last lesson, we talked about how Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Now, how did he get, how is he seated at the right hand of God? Well, after he became sin for us on the cross, he paid the price for sin. Fully, completely satisfied the claims of justice against all of us for all time. Past, present, future tense sins. And that he was raised to secure our justification. But then he ascended into heaven, presented his blood on the heavenly holy of holies, and then sat down at the right hand of God. We read it from yesterday, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, after he by himself purged our sins. That's when he sat down. Not until, not before, when he purged our sin, cleansed them out, wiped them out like they never even happened, dealt a death blow to sin. I'm talking about the sin condition, all of it, all inclusive. Then he sat down at the right hand of God. He becomes the evidence of our justification. He becomes the security for your justification and your qualification to receive anything from God, particularly in the area of healing. Now, with that in mind, and also we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 yesterday, how we've been raised up with him, and we've been made to sit together in heavenly places at his own right hand. We're also in that heavenly seat at the right hand of God. How did we get there? Well, if you had any trace of sin, any, any, any trace of, of not having your account balance, of you owing a sin debt, you could not sit there at the right hand of God. That, that describes our perfect 
righteousness, our perfect right standing with God right there. And see, that's where we are. But here in Hebrews chapter 10, get your Bibles out again. We're going to be looking at some other scriptures today. Hebrews chapter 10, and let's begin reading here with verse number 12. It says, but this man, talking about Jesus, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, I want you to see that right there, that it wasn't until your next sin, and then well, what's going to happen then? Is Jesus going to have to just keep coming back and, and, and just paying for individual sins? No, his one sacrifice for sin on that cross was good enough that it paid up the complete price, past, present, future 10 sins. It dealt with the sin condition once and once for all, forever. So he says that he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down at the right hand of God. I want you to see there again. He's seated at the right hand of God. Why? After offering that one sacrifice for sins that shall avail for all time, forever. And what is that sacrifice? Well, that was a sacrifice of himself. He was that Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. He was that Lamb of God without spot and blemish that offered himself up. And he was so perfect and so valuable or invaluable and so worthy that he, had, that he could by himself, offer himself up as a sacrifice and more than pay the price for the sins of the entire human race for all time forever. Boy, that's powerful. See, that gives us a revelation of the invaluable, worthy Jesus who's seated on the throne. I'm telling you. All right, look at verse number 14. It says, for by one offering, by one offering, what is that offering? Himself. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The Amplified reads, for by a single offering, he has forever completely cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy. See, that's telling us right there, in the eyes of God, you are blame, just as blameless and holy as Jesus because you're in him. You have his righteousness, his right standing with God. And you and your born again spirit are just as perfect in the eyes of God, just as free from sin, just as sinless in your spirit, in your born again recreated spirit as the Lord Jesus himself. If you weren't, you couldn't be seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God. You could not. So that's telling us right there, he is perfected forever. See, the problem is we're looking in the natural mirror. We're seeing ourselves, and we know all the bad stuff we've done. We know where we have come short of the glory of God. And to see if you are on your mind, if you're eating off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the me tree, I like to call it the me tree, the self tree. If you're just looking at yourself apart from Christ, you will never find, you'll never judge yourself to be worthy to receive anything from God, taking this heavenly seat, taking your place in Christ, receiving any of your inheritance. You're always going to be trying to work and earn it. Just like that prodigal son, the older son of the prodigal that went out. He, you know, he received his inheritance, but instead of enjoying it, receiving it, walking in the light of it, its benefits, he was out there working in the field trying to earn it. So you can't earn something that's already been earned by Jesus. And you can't add anything to it. Again, this is why we're calling this series Finished. You need to see this as a finished work and enter into the rest of God and cease from your own labors of trying to appease God and work for something that Jesus already wrought and given to you free by grace. Man, I get really excited about these things right here. It's made a huge difference in my life. I like what the message translation reads or the message uh, paraphrase, I guess we could say. It says, and I love this, it says, it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. <laughs> I love it. I'll read it again. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person, Jesus, to perfect some very imperfect people. That was us before we came to Jesus. We were all imperfect. But you know what? who Jesus is and what he did for us in his finished work was so big, so huge in the eyes of God 
that it completely swallowed up all we used to be. It swallowed up our old sins, our disqualifications, our coming up short of the glory of God acts. It completely swallowed up all of our imperfections in His perfection. So that's the way God sees us right now. See, if you don't see yourself that way, you're going to have a hard time receiving by faith something that legally belongs to you, something you, you can enjoy, a benefit from God that He's provided for you in Christ. But see, once you see this and accept this reality right here, I tell you, there's nobody, no adversary, no you can just steamroll Him with the power of the gospel that's hit your spirit in such revelation. Man, that's awesome. Let's go back one chapter to chapter 9. Man, I love the book of Hebrews. Man, it just set me free of a lot of religious tradition that really I found was unfounded according to the New Covenant. But notice here in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, in uh, verse number 12, and I'm just going to shift on over to the Amplified real quick on this one. Verse 12, it says, He went once for all. I want you to see that again. He went once for all. Once for all for all into the holy of holies of heaven not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves by which to make reconciliation between God and man in other words those are the sacrifices under the old covenant the the mosaic law provided for that it was only for a temporary time and it was all types and shadows to the coming Messiah the Lord Jesus the perfect sacrifice you know, there was some song written years ago. I never really paid much attention to it, but it went something that, you know, Jesus was just somewhere in the shadows. Well, how can the light of the world, the actual reality of all the types and shadows, how can he be in the shadow somewhere? <laughs> anyway, we'll forget that. But anyway, notice that Jesus is the perfect expression. He is what pointed all of these types and shadows of the old covenant law to. And when Jesus came in to fulfill this, he fulfilled it once and for all. The gospel ought to start out once upon a time and then ended happily ever after because that is the story of Jesus and the story of the gospel, the redemptive story in Christ. It says, but his own blood. Now look at here, but with his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption an everlasting release for us. Now notice, he found and secured a complete redemption. Wasn't that what we read over in Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 25, over in the Amplified just a couple of lessons ago, that he was raised from the dead to secure our justification? Notice he found and secured a complete redemption. I like the way it brings that out. A complete redemption. What does a complete rede redemption mean? It covered everything. In other words, everything that corrupted and tainted uh, our life in sin and the fall of man through the first Adam has now been saved, redeemed, and restored through the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His finished work. So, in other words, a complete redemption would include spirit, soul, body, financially, our families, our entire life. That redemption, that freedom, extends to every area and every part of our life not only in the sweet by and by, but right now in this present daily world that we live in. It says, but his own blood having found us secure and secured a complete redemption and an everlasting release for us. In other words, there's no expiration date on this redemption. There's no expiration date on the finished work of Jesus. It is a complete redemption. It is a once and once for all redemption. And it, was, it is for all times. It'll never lose its power. There's not going to be a day when you get up and say, well, you know, we've exhausted so much of the, of the redemptive grace of God in Christ that, boy, I tell you, it's just running thin and we're about out and God's going to have to just ration that out for the rest of it. Nope, never, ever. It's an everlasting release and a complete redemption, which means it includes healing in your physical body. Now look at verse 14. I'll shift back over to the New King James just for sake of time. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, in other words, Jesus wasn't just any person, any, any, just any person offering himself up on the cross for mankind, they would have also been under the sin debt. How can they pay the sin debt off? 
No, Jesus had to come, the son of the living God, the agent of creation, the creator himself, had to come and be manifested or embodied in a physical body through a virgin birth. No ties and not the corrupted blood of the first Adam, like the rest of us. That Notice that the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So when you get a revelation of the finished work of Jesus, it will cleanse your conscience from dead works. See, your spirit's already been cleansed. It's just as sinless, holy, and righteous as Jesus himself. That's the way God sees you. That's who God, that's, that's where God is looking in his finished work inside of you in your spirit. But notice, your conscience also has to be cleansed. You have to take what God did and then present it in his word and allow that to uproot that sin consciousness, that unfounded and unresolved guilt, shame, and condemnation that we all kind of carry over even when we're born again, that Satan takes advantage of to try to bring sickness, disease, and infirmity into our life. See, this is why it's important for us to get a hold of this. This is why this is part of the healing message right here is because most people are not receiving because they still have a consciousness of sin even as a believer. Even though they're justified in the Spirit, even though they're seated at the right hand of God in Christ, in they're in Christ Jesus, they still have that consciousness of sin because they're not allowing the finished work presented in the Word of God, in the Gospel message, to cleanse and uproot all that stuff. Very important. Now going down, wish you had more time on this. I've got other series online that deal with this in more detail. But look at verse number 25 and 26, same chapter, uh, chapter 9. It says, Not that Jesus should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. Talking about the high priest under the old covenant, he had to continually offer up more sacrifices. They had an expiration date. They'd run out. It's only temporary and never really did away with sin. But he's, he's comparing Jesus with that. And he said Jesus didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come and offer himself often, over and over again. He's not going to have to come back and deal with sin again somewhere in the future. Nope. Verse 26, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, right now, the new covenant is the now covenant. But now, once at the end of the ages, notice, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The Amplified puts it this way, that last phrase. He has once for all at the consummation and close of the ages appeared to put away and abolish sin by the sacrifice of himself. Notice we've seen words like he purged our sin, cleansed our sin, that we have a complete and an everlasting redemption. And notice it says that he appeared to put away and abolish sin. Well, did he do that? Well, if he didn't, it's not a finished work. It's not a complete redemption. He'd have to come back and finish it up. And listen, there's nothing you can do to add to this finished work. It's done. And there's nothing you have to do, listen, to earn or deserve healing in your body. Jesus bought and paid for that at the same time he was paying the sin debt off completely. Man, that's awesome. So notice he put away and abolished sin. Now, again, we can see this over and over again in Scripture, but let's look at a story that we've actually looked at before. It's the story of the man born by four. Let's go over to Luke's gospel and pick this one up, chapter five. Luke chapter five. I want you to see this right here. Luke chapter five, verse 17. It says, now it happened on a certain day as Jesus was teaching. Now, this is before he went to the cross. See, all the healings he did before he went to the cross are all by credit. And listen, if somebody could be healed by credit before Jesus actually went to the cross, how much more now should we receive and take our healing that Jesus has already perfected and completed and finished this work of redemption and he is seated at the right hand of God administrating and carrying out and enforcing this new covenant. He said, well, why didn't it just happen in my faith? Why, why didn't it just automatically happen? Because again, listen, you have to receive by faith. You have to possess by bold, confident faith 
everything that God has provided for you by grace in the finished work of Jesus. See, again, that's what Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our report, the report of the gospel, redemptive work, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? See, the arm or the power of God is going to be revealed and demonstrated, manifested in our life, to the degree to which we believe the report of Jesus. So again, he says in verse 17, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by. Who are these people? They were people who are using the law to try to earn something from God, from salvation all the way down to any of the blessings of God. And notice who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. I want you to see that the power of the Lord was present in Jesus to heal all of them. To heal all of them. Now, did them deserve it? Well, no, they didn't deserve it. Listen, no one who received healing from Jesus under his earthly ministry deserved it in and of themselves. I know they were trying to deserve it. They were trying to merit the favor of God. But see, all of this is grace, unmerited favor. The power of the Lord was already present there to heal them. Before they earned it, before they deserved it. Why? Because the Redeemer was right there in front of them. Now verse 18, Then behold, a man, being brought on a bed, a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him, before Jesus. And when they could not find out how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Now, I want you to see the story here. They brought their friend to Jesus by faith because they had heard about what Jesus was doing. They had heard about his teachings. Now, he presented words of grace, the gospel message. And so they, that sparked hope, and they brought that faith alone uh, caused them to act the way they did. They brought him to Jesus. Jesus was in a house teaching. All these crowd of people were around him. But notice they could find no one in because of the crowd. Now, who are these people? Legalistic people under the law. See, the law will always try to stand in your way. The law will always demand and then condemn you for not meeting the requirements yourself for the demands of the law. But see, that's not going to that's not gonna keep a man of faith out. Faith will go over the law. That didn't mean that God just all of a sudden says, all right, we're going to sweep the law under the rug. No, Jesus came to fulfill the law every bit of it. He was the reality of all the types and the shadows of the law. He perfectly met the requirements of the law for all of us and then gave us his 100% perfect score, his righteousness. So the, the law will stand in your way, but your faith will see you beyond that. But you know what? There's also walls and a, and a roof over that house. That represented the natural limitations of them receiving healing. But you know what? Faith will see you through all of it. The legal requirements of the law that you can't meet on your own without Jesus. And second of all, all the natural limitations that are telling us it can't be done. It, you, you can't have this. Do you know what? Their faith took them up over the, over, over the requirements of the law, broke up the limitations in the natural realm and lowered their friend down in the midst before Jesus. And notice verse 20, and Jesus saw their faith. Now notice when Jesus saw their faith, he didn't, go, he didn't start rebuking them. Say, how dare you try to come up and over and, and, and try to you know side skirt around this thing. No, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now is that when those man, that man's sins were forgiven him? Nope. As far as Jesus was concerned, he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was about to go to the cross. He was about to take this man's sin along with everyone's sin and bring it to an end. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. Or if they're forgiven, there's no record of them. If, you, if they're forgiven, there's no basis for keeping him under that condition any longer. If he's forgiven, there's no basis for condemnation, guilt, and shame in his life anymore. No, this is not when this, man, this man's sins were forgiven. This is, the, this is the moment where Jesus gave him some information, some revelation that he needed to know in order to receive his healing from God. And so uh, verse 21, the scribes, Pharisees, they began to reason. They got mad and they said, who is this who speaks blasphemies? 
who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, they made a right statement there in, in their question that only God can forgive sins, but they're in inference there. They were implying that God can but won't. And, and you know, not only will he not, he has done nothing about it. Well, all, all of that is, true, that is false. God not only can, but will forgive sins. And listen, step further, He has already provided the forgiveness of sins through the finished work of Jesus. Verse 22, But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, He answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? See, we can naturally reason all day, and that's going to lead you away from faith, not to faith. He said, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? Now notice he said both of them are easy. And notice that he put them both in the same category of salvation. It's all included. He says, which is easier, easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? Verse 24, but that you may know. Now he already gave this man a, an indication of what he's about to tell him right here. He was already giving him a sample or uh, an insight of what he was going to say to him. He said, but you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed. Now notice that he is forever coupling these two th things together. He is integrating the forgiveness of sins and the healing of this man's body once and once for all. And we need to see it that way because God considers when Jesus dealt with sin, he dealt with the whole thing, the whole sin condition. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. What gave this man, what gave Jesus the right to say this to this man? And what gave this man the right to take his healing? Was the fact that Jesus was redeeming him from all of it from all the sins, all the condemnation, guilt, shame, the punishment, everything. This is all together. And immediately, verse 25, immediately. He didn't have to wait. He didn't have to go earn it as an additional part of his salvation. Immediately, he just took it. He rose up took before them, took up what he'd been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Boy, that's powerful. And forever and always, these two are put together. Forgiveness of sins and healing of your body. That's all the time I've got for this lesson. Join us in the next lesson. If you'd like additional materials, go to TonyCowan.org. We'll see you in the next lesson. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We hope that it really blessed you. Hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you also turn on the notifications so that you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, go ahead and hit that like button. And if God's doing awesome things in your life like we're believing Him for, then we would love for you to share that with us. So leave us a comment. Let us know all the good things God's doing in your life. We'll see you next time.